Good morning. Today's reading is Romans chapter 8, 12 through 17. So then, brethren, you are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as son by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testified with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children hears also hears of God and follow hears with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I found a story about the United States Post Office. It doesn't tell me in this story where or what city this happened in. Uh, I guess as they say, maybe the, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. Um, most of us who live here in Philadelphia, I think almost as far as I know, all of us live in Philadelphia. Um, this will not be a surprise that maybe this actually happened here, but there was a, an audit <clears throat> performed by the US Postal Service in one city and discovered that some of the local managers had temporarily stashed unprocessed mail in trailers that were parked in the parking lot of the post service, Postal Service. And they did this so that the supervisors would not notice that the um, mail had been delayed in its delivery. As they went through these trailers, what they discovered was millions of pieces of undelivered mail, um, including 2.3 million bulk business letters, some of which were delayed up to nine days. From my experience, that doesn't sound too bad, actually. Uh, they found 800,000 first-class letters that they discovered were delayed by sometimes up to three days. Uh, we have seen much, much worse with the post office here in Philadelphia, but that's another story. The question is, what should the penalty be when the people entrusted with delivering the mail, what should their penalty be for failing to do that? Well, the world may not be expecting the delivery of the gospel from us, but we must be faithful in delivering that message. I think you will agree that, you, that if we ever needed courageous and committed followers of Jesus Christ to deliver the message of the gospel to, this, to our world around us, it is today. Because we will never effectively proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ if we lack assurance that we belong to Jesus Christ. In verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, here in Romans chapter 8, they show us that we can do and find out exactly what Paul encouraged us to do in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. So we're going to continue. We, the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, parts of this test. We're going to continue with this test today. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians um, so I'm at second, second Corinthians 13, he said, to examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless you fail the test? My hope and my prayer is that nobody here will fail the test. Or if you do fail the test, that you'll find success in Christ uh, today. But when we talk about being assured that we actually belong to Christ, last week we talked about what the Bible says about being adopted into his family, a beautiful picture. But all too often, even believers can come to the point of doubting their salvation. Why would they doubt? Well, there are perhaps several possibilities. They may not know 
the assurance that the Bible gives to believers. They may not understand the scripture well enough to have that assurance. Um, maybe they look at their own lives and become discouraged that their growth in holiness seems to be so slow. Or maybe they think their growth in holiness is really quite lame as well. So that could be a discouragement, a discouraging thing as well. But you know, I thought of a third reason why some people may doubt their salvation. And I don't know if anybody here would be guilty of this, but something to think about. How can I stick my neck out for the Lord when I don't feel secure in my relationship with him? In other words, our lack of assurance could be an excuse for why we do not boldly share Jesus Christ with the culture around us. Say, well, I don't think I'm mature enough, old enough, well enough uh, in my understanding of scripture to do that. Those are three excuses. There may be others, but I'm just saying having an assurance and having a rock solid conviction that we really do belong to Jesus Christ is absolutely essential if we're going to be faithful in displaying the gospel to the world around us. Now, if a person's not sure that they're on their way to heaven, and that may be you this morning, I would suggest learning more about the Bible. You can do that as on your own if you'd like to study scripture, or we'd be glad to give you some information to share along that line. But study what the Bible has to say, learn what God has to say about your assurance, and then fall on your knees and pray until that assurance comes. How could a person fear that they may slip into hell at any moment and not make assurance a top priority? Think about it. If you're not sure, you're not convinced that you're on your way to heaven, maybe you are, but maybe you aren't. You need that assurance, and I do too. It is too important for us to say, well, whatever, I guess it doesn't matter. It does matter. In, um, in a book written by James Smith, it was actually published in 1859, it was entitled, An Unsaved, per Unsaved Person's Perspective on Christians. Now, I want to read part of this to you because that, it helps us get a grip on the importance of having an assurance that we belong to Christ and how that affects our relationship with the world. This person said, I don't believe that you Christians believe your own creed. For if you were persuaded that things really, really are as the Bible teaches and that we poor lost people were really going to such a dreadful place as you say hell is, then you would act more humanely toward us. If you saw our houses on fire, you would run to help us, to help put out the fire. If you saw us in danger of any kind of death, you would try to do something to save us. But you pretend to believe that we are going to hell. And that hell burns with fire and brimstone forever. And that once there, we can never, ever get out. And yet you talk about us, talk to us about all sorts of things, but not about our need for Christ. So he says, I have this, I have reason, uh, I have reasoned this out and thought about it. Either you Christians don't believe what you say, or else you must be the most hardened, unfeeling wretches in the universe. Now, I don't believe that you are such cruel, hardened, and unfeeling people as this, as I may suppose. But then I conclude that with all your talk, you Christians really don't believe what the Bible teaches. For if you really believe what you say about sin and hell and our danger, then you would act differently. And if you have a spark of kindness in your hearts, you would try to save us from such a dreadful doom. And he goes on. We need to find, as Christians, our usefulness in this world. And what I'm saying is we must start applying that usefulness with a, a rock solid conviction that we belong to Christ. Christians need to know that they're Christians, quite frankly. Otherwise, we will not have to, we will not have uh, sustained joy. We will not have 
courage to confront the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might remember that one of the last words that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven are recorded for us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus promised his followers that you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to the entire world, as said, even to the, the remotest parts of the earth. So we can't say, well, I, I'm just not able. Well, right, you're not, and neither am I. But we do have access to the Holy Spirit who can give us the power to do that. So with that introduction in mind, I want us to just kind of get the big picture first of all. And in this part of uh, Romans chapter 8, we've learned, we are learning that the Holy Spirit cements our relationship to God. And in these four verses, we've already looked at verse 14. Christians are the sons of God. We looked at verse 15. Christians are adopted by God. We saw that last week. And today we're going to look at the fact that Christians are children of God. And we'll learn what that means. And then, Lord willing, when we get back to it in verse 17, Christians are heirs of God. We inherit God. Now, what we've learned so far in verse 14 is those who are sons of God are ruled by the Holy Spirit. So the believer's position is that we're sons of God. The proof of a believer's position is that they are led by the Holy Spirit. And then last week we saw verse 15, those who are adopted by the Holy Spirit are intimate with God. And that is really uh, the main focus. That's, but the believer's position is that we are adopted actually into God's family. And then the proof of that is that we are able then to cry out, Abba, Father. So today I want us to look at verse 16. It's a short verse, but there's much for us to learn here. Look at verse 16. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So we're going to follow the same pattern. We're going to see a believer's position and then proof of a believer's position. So... Those who are God's children now, our children, know they belong. And that's for your outline if you're following along with the handout. Those who are God's children know they belong. And if you're in the doubters category, we hope to solve that before the message is done. So let's first look, all, look at a believer's position. Children of God. The word Children, as we learned last week, literally means born ones, or child here means born ones. When it's used in the plural, ch children, it refers to the descendants or the posterity. In other words, just as he got done talking about the fact that we are adopted members of God's family, it's, it, this is amazing. God looks at us as his children, as his descendants. That should move us to praise. And thank God, oh hallelujah, that that's actually the case. He looks at us as his own descendants. John 1, 12, but as many as received Christ, to them he gave right to become, and here it goes, children of God, even to those, or especially to those, or primarily the, to, to those who believe in his name. So what happens? How does this position help us to understand that we are children of God? Well, God gives us the Holy Spirit as a pledge or a down payment that our salvation is absolutely, positively, 100% guaranteed. At verse 23, we're gonna, Paul's going to come back to this truth in, uh, a little bit later. He says, we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So that's a little different focus but it's, it's an aspect of that we'll, Lord willing, get to later. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.22, God has also sealed us, and he gave us the Holy Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. The pledge is the idea of a down payment. And to realize that uh, God has already given us a, a proof that we belong to him, and we'll see more about that in a second. The Bible makes it clear, by the way, it is absolutely possible to be a child of God. It is absolutely possible to be a child of God. Girls, are you with me? 
Um, let's remind ourselves that this is not something that's just way off high in the sky sometime later. It's something that we can actually have because God has promised it. So the question for all of us is, of course, are you adopted into God's family? Are you a child of God? Listen to 1 John 5, verses 10, 11, and 12. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. This is, parallels what we're learning today. The one who does not believe God has made God a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given to us concerning his Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life, who has not the Son does not have life. We can actually have the Son of God as our Father. Or he says a few verses later, beginning in verse 19, we know that we are of God. Don't you like that? We not only can be members of God's family and adopted into God's family, but we can know that we are in God's family. Paul makes, I mean, John makes this so clear. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. Now, let's be clear that this is one of the tactics that Satan has uh, against us is to get us to doubt what God says. It happened pretty early in the uh, history of mankind, did it not? We can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 with Adam and Eve. It says, now the serpent, which is the form that Satan took, was more crafty than any beast in the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, here are the words, indeed, has God said? Has God said? Did, is that really true? That he entertained, it got, got her to entertain a, a thought of doubt. Is it really true? Has God actually said that you shall not eat of the trees of the garden, if you know the story? But by the way, we see this other places in the Bible as well. Even Satan, when he uh, tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he tried to get Jesus to doubt during Christ's tempta uh, temptation there. He, by asking, we read in Matthew 4, 3, if you are the son of God, now, I know that word if can be translated since, but in the context, I think it's better to translate it if. I think Satan is saying to, to, to Jesus, oh, I don't know, are you really the son of God? Galatians 4, 6 says, because you're sons, here's the solution. God has sent forth the spirit, the Holy Spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, I have a father, as we learned last week. I like the way Paul David Tripp encourages us. He says, we don't enjoy just freedom from guilt and shame and punishment. That's important, but that's not all. We enjoy the full rights and privileges of our new identity as children of God, children of the King. God doesn't tolerate us like a spurned judge who saw his guilty verdict overturned. He accepts us with the tender love of a father, end quote. Isn't that beautiful? What a glorious thing that God has done not only to forgive us and to cleanse us from our sin, but to give us this new identity. We actually belong to the family of God. So what kind of love is this? I'm just going to go through this very quickly. God has chosen us to be adopted into his family. God has chosen us to be adopted into his family. God lavished his love on each of us even before we put our trust in Christ. Think about that. God loved you long before you ever thought about loving him. God has not chosen, God has chosen me to be with him forever. Number three. Wow. God has chosen me. God has chosen me to be with him forever. God offers total and complete forgiveness and kind of sum it up. A holy God who knows my wicked, selfish heart, still chooses to love me and to make me a part of his family. I've adapted these thoughts 
from Rand Hummel, the director of the wilds in New England. I want to give him credit for that. But these are things that should remind us of how, our, how important it is that we be in awe of this God and what it means to be adopted into his family. Rand Humble goes on to say, as exciting and wonderful it is to know that you're a part of God's family, don't be expecting any parties or congratulations from the unbelieving world. They don't know God and therefore it's no big deal to them that you do. So what are we supposed to do with this? We are supposed to introduce the world to our Heavenly Father, end quote. That's our position. Again, it's, un it's important to understand what we are in Christ. Now, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the proof of a, believer, of a believer's position. The proof of a believer's position. It says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. Now, let me just remind you that Paul began this chapter by saying, therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And then in verses 14 through 18 that we've been looking at, Paul is showing us how we can know there is no condemnation for us personally. So let's never forget that God not only makes it possible for us to know that we belong to him, but God also wants us to know that we belong to him. 1 Corinthians 2.12, we have received <clears throat> not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit, who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. A few verses later, uh, in, well, 1 John 5, 13, he says, These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know. My goal today, if, there, if I had to boil it down into one goal, would be to say that we would leave this room having a rock-solid assurance that we know that we belong to Christ and that we have eternal life. And we know, he says in 1 John 5, 20, that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. God wants you to know. God wants you to have that conviction. He wants that question, if there is a question in your heart, to be settled once and for all. So that brings us to this question. How does the Holy Spirit reassure our spirits that we are actually forgiven by God and that we are members of his family. How does he do that? Well, the obvious problem, of course, is the Holy Spirit's invisible and our spirits are invisible. Have you ever seen your spirit? No, you haven't, and I haven't either. But you know what? You have not seen the Holy Spirit either. As we saw last week, the Holy Spirit adopts us or places us as members of God's family. So how can we know by the assurance of the Holy Spirit that that has actually happened? R.C. Sproul adds this comment that's helpful. He says, the work of the Holy Spirit is not only to make us children of God and to take up a dwelling place within our hearts, but also give us an inner assurance of our standing with God. It is vitally important for Christians to have assurance of salvation, end quote. One of the old reformers uh, said that uh, the Holy Spirit pours into our hearts such confidence that we venture to call God our Father. I want that to sink in for a minute. It, it impacted me. Let me read it again. The Holy Spirit pours into our hearts such confidence that we can venture to call God our Father. I think the more we understand that, the more in awe we will be that that actually is possible. And he goes on to say, we can't rightly pray to God unless we're surely persuaded in our hearts that he is our Father. By the way, we should never be casual about the privilege of being able to call God our Father. I fear, and I've seen this in my own life, perhaps you have as well, that we talk about, well, God's our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, call the Lord's Prayer. It's easy to say those words, is it not? But I think it's also easy to say them without really understanding the meaning behind that that we can actually call God Father. John says in 1 John 3, 1, what great love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. So when we think about being children of God or God being our Father, 
Who is he? Who is this father that we are saying is our father? Well, that's probably about 10 sermons right there that we could spend time. But let me summarize just a couple of thoughts. The father is the I am that I am. The eternally self-existent one. The father is the one who had no beginning and will have no end. He has existed eternally, is totally sufficient by himself. He is the almighty one. He is the Lord and the ruler of everything. He is the almighty creator. He is the savior. And we know also he is the king of kings. And the Bible says he is also a consuming fire, just to name a few. And to think about the fact that God has made it possible so that Christians can be members of the God of the universe. Just as the seven witnesses to a Roman adoption that we learned about last week had to be willing to testify publicly in court that the adoption was legal, the Holy Spirit lives in a believer to assure them that they are really adopted into God's family. Now, let's get a little more practical. How does the Holy Spirit prove that a person's adopted? Nothing less than a supernatural miracle from the Holy Spirit could be proof. Octavius Winslow said, if the Spirit of Christ is in your heart, the fruits of the Spirit will be exhibited in your life. Oops. Wow. Think about it. If the Holy Spirit is in you, then the fruit of the Holy Spirit is being grown in your life and you can look at that and you should see the fruit of the spirit in your life as a miracle because only the power of the holy spirit can produce love real loves that you are more concerned about others than yourself joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and here's a hard one self-control and against such things there's no law now if we look at a list of the fruit of the spirit like that i hope you with me would say wow i've i've still got a long ways to go but that's not the question at this point the question is where have you come from as you look at your life do you see that you are growing in the fruit of the spirit now, when we see those fruits growing in us, it can only be attributed to God's power because that's not something we can do on our own. Now, we can discipline ourselves to become better people to a degree, but the difference is when we do that, we grow in our self-improvement perhaps, but we grow in our focus on ourselves. We discipline ourselves to become better people and the response can easily be, wow, well, look at me, look, I'm doing better now. Woo, look at me. I'm so glad I used to do these things and I don't do them anymore. And you might almost break your arm trying to pat yourself on the back. But that is not the case when we understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Darnold Barnhouse warns us that no spiritual experience is valid in itself. So how do we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us? How do we know that we are members of his family? It, we cannot rely on some kind of personal experience alone it has to be a supernatural experience he goes on to say because every experience can be counterfeited no experience is valid that is not based on what god says darnell bonhar said in our end quote now think about this paul gave us a beautiful example he said he worked hard for jesus as a matter of fact, he worked, says he worked harder than any of the other apostles. But then he was quick to point out that he only did that as God gave him the ability to do it. Listen to how he worded that in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And God's grace to me did not prove vain or worthless. I labored even more than all of them, talking about the other apostles, yet not I 
but the grace of God with me. You see the difference? When we rely upon the Holy Spirit and we see him working miraculous things in our lives and making us more like Christ, he gets the glory. We realize it's a work that he's doing in our lives. If we are doing anything that promotes selfishness or pride, it cannot be from the Holy Spirit. When we have a desire for holiness and we long more and more to know the Lord better, that's the Holy Spirit. And it can only be the Holy Spirit. Jesus put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they, and the implication is they and they alone, will be satisfied. Bible teacher John MacArthur describes it this way, quote, when believers are compelled by a love for God and they feel a deep hatred for sin and they reject the world and they long for Christ's return and they love other Christians and they experience answered prayer and discern between truth and error and long for and move toward Christ likeness, the work of the Holy Spirit is evidence and those believers have witnessed that they truly are children of God, end quote. I hope you heard what he said. So has there been a miracle performed in your life so that now when once at one point you didn't care about God or Christ or following him or was not a big deal to you, you were satisfied with your own life or even satisfied with what you did religiously? But can you look back and say, wow, God has changed me. So now I hunger for righteousness. John goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3, O oh, children, let us love, not just with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know this by, uh, by but that we are of the truth, and we will assure our hearts before God in whatever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Therefore, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence with God. So let me close by asking a question to give us an opportunity to think about ourselves individually. Don't answer out loud, but do you want to see the world changed? If you're really happy with the way the world is right now and the culture is, I guess I just feel sorry for you. Our culture is a mess, and in my opinion, degrading and getting worse. But do you want to do something to change the world? Or let me narrow it down a little bit for those of us who live here in Juniata. Would you like to do something to help change this neighborhood? Admiral William H. McRaven is a retired United States Navy four-star admiral. He last served as the ninth commander of the United States Special Operations Command. And in 19, or in 2014, he delivered the commencement address at the University of Texas in Austin, and he's delivered several of these. And he describes, of course, his training to be a U.S. Navy SEAL. And he took inspiration from the, church, from the school's motto, which was, what starts here changes the world. And he used this illustration. He looked out over the sea of graduates and he said, tonight, more than 8,000 students are graduating. The average American in his lifetime will meet about 10,000 people. If every one of you changed the lives of just 10 people and each one of those people changed the lives of another 10 people and another 10 in five generations, that would be 125 years this class would have changed the lives of 800 million people. Go just one more generation and you could change the entire population of the world of 8 billion people. End quote. Now, obviously we don't have 8,000 students graduating. We have a, a small group here, but this, these statistics still hold true exponentially. The point is, God could use Bethel Chapel Church to change this neighborhood. 
But that's not going to happen until we reach out to the unsaved with a rock-solid conviction that we know that we have been adopted into God's family. But here's the problem. It is much easier to talk about problems that we see around us or in the news than it is to talk about Jesus as the only solution to those problems. We need to speak truth and we need to speak solutions to a culture around us, not just bewail the problems. That's easy. Anybody can do that. Anybody can see the problem. But we need to see the solution. I come back to Rand Hummel, who, was the, who is the director of the Wilds Christian Camp in New England, and he challenges us with this. He said, quote, introduce your unbelieving friends to God as they listen to what you say, what you text, what you write, and how you share your faith in Christ on social media. Introduce your friends to God as they watch what you do. Your desire to become like Christ will be seen in the way that you express your love Demonstrate your joy, live in peace, and model patience with a humble and gentle spirit. I began with a, an illustration about the United States Post Office. And it's disappointing when the Post Office fails to deliver the mail. And I have experienced that uh, way too many times. But it's tragic when a Christian fails to share or deliver the gospel. Are you delivering the gospel? Do you talk more about the solution to our problems than the problems themselves? Let's look at this quote. And this is from Marjorie um, Christian missionary. He says, always seek peace between you and your heart and God. But in this world, always be careful to remain ever restless, never satisfied, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Jim Elliott. Oh, that's my prayer for me. And that's my prayer for you. We live in a wicked and dying and dark world, but there's light. There's the light of the gospel to shine in the lives of the people around us. Let's never forget that we are called to deliver the gospel to those around us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this reminder of our duty that you do testify with our spirit that we are children of God, but not just so that we can heave a sigh of relief and know that heaven is in our future. But Lord, may we also realize how important it is for us to be ever active in sharing the wonder and the awe of that good news with those around us who don't know you. And Lord, I, I ask earnestly that you would be with everyone who's listening to me holy spirit that you'd open their heart if they don't know you they would realize that maybe they're not members of your family yet maybe they've never turned from sin and asked for your forgiveness oh lord may this be the day that they get alone with you and ask for your forgiveness and surrender to you that they might find this beautiful wonderful, amazing, awe-inspiring relationship with you and to find out that you have loved them and you will love them for eternity if they turn to you. So Lord, please perform that miracle of new birth in, any, in the lives of anybody who has yet to experience it. We pray in Jesus' name.